please remain standing if you're able as we read God's Word. We'll be beginning today in the book of Luke, chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we do just give you all praise and we exalt you in this church, your church. I thank you for all the brothers and sisters that are here to worship you. Lord, you tell us we're two, when two or more come together in your name, you're here. So Lord, we know you are right here in our presence right now and we thank you. We praise you for that. Lord, use today to shape us, to transform us, to help us become more like you so that the world can see you through us so that your brightness, your light shines in this community and throughout the world. Jesus, you're our Lord, our Savior, our King, and we give you all praise. It's in your most holy and precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I am not Nasser. I am Dave Parker. As Nicole said, I'm the community pastor. Um, a good friend of ours, Pastor Dave Collins and his church ambassador, he planted it um, probably six months to a year ago. And Pastor Nasser is going to help him to encourage that church and just help them to continue grow. And when he's gone, it is always a pleasure and privilege to be able to get up here and share God's Word with you today. Now, I am covering all of chapter 16, so we are going to cover a lot of material today. There's two parables, and in the middle, Jesus talks to the Pharisees. Don't we love it when Jesus talks to the Pharisees? Always love that. But I'm going to start with a joke, all right? Now, two things on this joke. First of all, don't send me emails about the bad theology. It is bad theology. It's a joke, all right? And second, I've used this in discipleship, so if you all have heard this, don't shout out the punchline, because others might not have heard it. No, Dave, don't shout it out. All right, so here's the joke, and it ties into the message today. There's this rich man, and he is very wealthy, and he's very old. He's Old Testament old, and he knows his days are coming, so he is pleading with God, saying, Lord, let me bring some with me. He's got so much. And every day he's pleading, and God finally says, okay, you can bring one bag with you. So this man, he's thinking, okay, what am I going to do? So he goes, and he sells everything he has, gets a big bag, changes it all to gold, and fills that bag full of gold. All right, so in due time, he passes away. He takes his bag. He's heading up to the pearly gates, and Peter's there and goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You are not allowed to bring anything with you. And the rich man says, no, no, I've got a deal. God says I could bring this bag. He says, well, I better check this out. So he gets out his phone. They have rotary phones in heaven, in case you didn't know. He gets out his phone, and he's dialing. He says, Lord, did you? God says, yeah, I, I did. So he says, okay. So Peter says, all right. It's all right. And then he says, but wait. I got to see what you're bringing. So he opens the bag. Peter looks in, and he goes, pavement? <laughs> all right. And this leads me to my self-examination question. I don't know what this rock is, but I'm going to trip on it. All right, my self-examination question is, are you a good manager of your resources? A lot of you are going to say yes. A lot of you are going to say, yeah, I got my 401k. I'm contributing to my retirement plan, et cetera. But let's go and take this and change it a little bit. Let's expand this self-examination question. Are you a good manager of your resources that God has provided you according to his desires? Ooh, a little tougher. Takes a little more thinking. 
a little more meditating. And that's what chapter 16, Jesus is going to talk to us about. So who's excited about God's Word? All right, let's go ahead and dig in. I've got a lot of verses to cover. Verse 1, chapter 16. He, Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. All right, so Jesus is setting the stage for us here. Some important details. First detail, who's Jesus talking to? He's talking to his disciples. All right, he's talking to believers. He's talking to us. All right, are there Pharisees listening? Yep, we're going to come on a little later and find out there's Pharisees there listening too. There could be others, but Jesus is directing this parable to his disciples. So what do we know about the parable? There's a rich man, and he has a manager, okay? He's rich enough that he has a manager who's taking care of his wealth for him, all right? And that manager was not doing a good job. He was wasting his possessions. Now, interesting, that word wasting, the Greek to it is the exact same word that Pastor Nasser used last week on the prodigal son, where the prodigal son was squandering his inheritance, same word. Some translations actually say squandering, not wasting. So this manager is not doing a good job taking care of the possessions that uh, the rich man had put him in charge of. All right, we continue. And he, the rich man, called him, the manager, and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be my manager. Basically, he's telling them, you're fired. All right? But now, he didn't say, you're fired, go clean out your desk and get out of here. He says, I want you to go back and build an accounting and come show me how poorly you have been managing my stuff and what you, you have done. So he didn't kick him out. He said, go back to the office and come and report to me on everything that you've done wrong. All right, verse 3. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. So the manager knows he's going to be fired. He knows when the master sees that accounting, he's toast. All right, he's in big trouble. And he says, wow, I am a desk jockey. I cannot go out and dig ditches. I am too proud to beg. What am I going to do? I need a plan. Well, in these next verses, we hear about his plan. Verse 4, I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. So he came up with a plan. The plan was, I'm going to call people in and reduce their bill and so that they owe less. And when they owe less, they are going to love me. You know, that would be kind of like those of us who have a mortgage, the bank calling you and saying, come on down. You know how you owe 200000 on your house? Quick, write 100000 and sign. How many of us would sign? <laughs> we would sign quickly. So that's what he's doing. And you're going to say, well, wait, how does that get him into to where they're going to take him into their house? When first century um, Israel, there was a very, very strong honor code. Very strong. If he did something for them that helped them, through honor, they had to help him out. So that when he came to them and said, hey, I've been fired. I got no place to go. Can you put me up? Through honor, they'd have to say, yeah, you just cut my mortgage down to $100,000. Come on in. And he did this. We have two accounts of two debtors, but he did it lots of places. Some of you might say, well, that seems pretty, you know, honor code. Let them move in. Well, guys, we kind of still have that today. 
Earlier in the week, I had somebody ask me, can you use your truck? I got a truck at church, so I get used everywhere all the time. So I had a truck, and they said, can you help me move a basketball goal? And I said, well, you know, I'm working on a message for Sunday. I had a memorial service yesterday I officiated. I said, I'm really busy. I don't have time. And he said, well, hey, Dave, I helped you move a refrigerator. I helped you move a couch. I helped you move... And I was like, yeah, you're right. So I went and helped to move. So we still kind of have that today. If somebody does something good for you, how, don't you all feel like, well, he did me a good turn. I've got to do him a good turn. That's what the dishonest manager was counting on. And the honor code then was so strong that it would carry over into that. Now, here's where this parable and some... Well, a lot of commentaries say this parable is the most confusing parable that Jesus gave out of the 40-plus he gave in the Bible. All right? And this is where it starts to get confusing. It's really not, but it confuses some people. Verse 8, the master, the rich man, commended or praised the dishonored manager for his shrewdness. And everybody's like, wait a second. He just swindled you out of money and profits. Why would you be praising or commending this person? You've got to understand the, the rich man's not praising him for taking and, and his money away from him. He's praising him for being shrewd in looking to his future and taking care of his future and what's going to happen to him. He's not saying, well, that's wonderful that you stole money, or he didn't steal it, but cheated me out of money. He's saying, you're being shrewd and that you're taking care of your future. He still was in charge of that money. The manager didn't say you're fired, or the rich man didn't say you're fired, pack it and leave. So he still had control, and he used that control to pad his future. And the master is saying, that was shrewd. You were shrewd in taking care of that. Well, it gets even more confusing Because in the next verse, Jesus says, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And that throws people. But what he's basically telling us is my first lesson. And that first lesson is that God desires his children to use what he gives them wisely. He says that the people of this world, you know, unbelievers, when it comes to managing their resources and their wealth, they're very shrewd. And he's saying we need to be the same way. As children of light, as his sons and daughters, we need to be shrewd with how we manage what he's blessed us with in the same way. And he's talking money here, but it's bigger than that. Look at 1 Peter 4.10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards, good managers of God's very grace. God expects us to use what he has blessed us with in a wise way and be good managers of what he's given us. Amen? Amen. You guys are kind of quiet. I know it's a tough parable. It is a tough parable, but it's pretty, it makes sense. He's wanting us to use what he's given us wisely. And you say, well, what does that mean? How do I use it wisely? Well, very next verse, he tells us. Verse 9, And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Perfectly clear, right? Everybody's got it. All right, well, I'm going to confuse you more. Here's the lesson from that. What are we supposed to do to use our resources wisely? Share the gospel, make disciples, repeat. Some of you are saying, well, Dave, I know that's the church mantra, but how do you get that out of verse 9? I'm so glad you asked. All right, what does he tell us? Jesus tells us that we are to make friends using unrighteous wealth. What's unrighteous wealth? Money. 
The money that he's provided us, is money good or bad? No, it's how you use it. Unrighteous wealth. He's giving us the money. He's giving us gifts. He's giving us resources. And he tells us we're to use them to make friends. And what do the friends do? They receive us into eternal dwellings. What's an eternal dwelling? Where's our eternal dwelling? Heaven. So if we're making friends who are going to receive us into heaven, what do we have to do? Share the gospel. See the connection? Yep. Yeah. yeah, good. Some of you see it, not all of you. Do you see the connection? Yeah. Yes. All right. If we are going to make friends who receive us into heaven, we have to share the gospel. You say, well, how do I do that with my wealth? You guys seen the map in the back. We support missionaries all around the world. What do missionaries do? Share the gospel. You're using your wealth. What do we do in this church every week? Share the gospel. When we support the church, we're doing that. He's saying, use your resources wisely to help make friends who are going to be in heaven with us. Sidebar. Have you ever thought about, have you ever heard where people have died and gone to heaven and they're welcomed by friends and family? That kind of supports that. Making friends who welcome you into heaven. All right, back to the, to the text. <laughs> so, he's telling us that we need to do that. In Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are of the earth. If we're being wise, we're setting our minds of things above. If we're using our resources wisely, we're using them for things above. You say, well, what happens if we don't? Well, he talks about it, verse 10 through 12. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have, been, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Lesson is, if you can't manage little worldly things, why is God going to bless you with big, true, riches, spiritual things? He's not. If you can't manage the little things well, why is he going to bless you with the big things? Why is he going to bless you with those? And he said, I'm not going to. In Matthew 25, 21, there's a parable. I don't have time to cover it. I'm covering too much here. But in the parable, it's the parable of the talents. A master gives talents, money, to his servants and says, I'm going away, use it wisely. The ones who used it wisely, he tells them in Matthew 25, 21, the thing we all want to hear someday, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter in the joy of your master. If we're faithful in little, he's going to give us much. If we can manage the little worldly things, he's going to give us the big spiritual, true riches to handle. Yeah. Thank you, William. And that is what he's telling us there. And then we get to that verse, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And the lesson here is an easy one. Lesson four, get your priorities straight. Get your priorities straight. God first. We're serving God first. Money is way down here. We're not serving money, but we're using it wisely. He's telling us, guys, we got to get our priorities straight. If I've blessed you with resources, use them wisely. Use them to make friends who are going to be in heaven with us. We're either going to welcome them or they're going to welcome us into heaven. Don't be focused on the things of this world. Don't be focused on the toys that we can buy with the money. Does that mean we can't have any toys? Of course we can. But that's not your focus. Our focus is on serving God and taking care of His kingdom. So we are to, you know, don't spend all your time in video games or don't spend all your time been watching TV or... Here's a tough one. Don't spend all your time playing golf. Yes. But that's what he's saying. 
Get your priorities straight, and your number one priority is serving God and doing His work, which takes us back to share the gospel, make disciples, and repeat. So that's the end of that first parable. And I didn't think it was that confusing. I know some people do. But <clears throat> then we get to the Pharisees, and as I said, I love it when the Pharisees open their mouth and Jesus is around. And verse 14 the Pharisees who have been listening, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed them. Stop right there. Go back to that. You know, I don't think it's wise to be ridiculing the creator of the heavens and earth. I think that's a bad idea to do that at any time. But here they are ridiculing Jesus. And the first reason I think they're ridiculing Jesus is because they're looking at him and saying, you're a carpenter, you got fishermen as disciples, and you're talking about money, and you're talking about wealth. You know, that's really not in your wheelhouse. <laughs> and that's where I think one of the reasons they're ridiculing him. But Jesus hits him back, and he says, if then, whoops, wrong verse, Jesus says, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your heart. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Right, Jesus says, wait a second. You guys, God knows your heart. Here, you guys are lovers of money, and what you're concerned about are things to puff you up in front of men. You want to sit, in other places, he says, you want to sit at the table of elevated honor at the feasts and the festivals. You want to wear these beautiful robes and gowns and have people just praise you as you're walking through the streets. And he says, the things that you value, the things that you think are wonderful, are an abomination to God. And it takes me to lesson five, which is, you know, brothers, we can't hide anything from God. If you think you can hide anything from God, you are... He knows your heart. He knows your desires. He knows your motives. And what he's saying is to the Pharisees, he's saying, you guys have got it all wrong. Psalm 44, 21, would not God discover this for he knows the secrets of the heart? Says, you guys are all wrong. And then he hits them again. He hit them once, now he's going to hit them again. He says, the law and the prophets were until John... Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into heaven. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. All right, we're back to that confusion. It's like, wait, how did we get from over here to divorce and marriage and adultery. How'd that happen? Well, you got to realize, what is Jesus hitting them on? What were the Pharisees supposed to be? They are supposed to be the ones who are the keepers of the law. They're supposed to be teaching everybody the truth about God and what the law does. And boy, they had gotten so out of whack on what they were teaching. They had created 600 and some additional rules that they were imposing on people. They had gotten away from the fact that it's about a relationship with God and loving God and being an example and living. They were way out of kilter of what they were supposed to do. And Jesus is saying, guys, you're hitting me for money. You guys don't even know what you're supposed to be doing. You've got it all wrong. You're teaching people the wrong things. And adultery in marriage is just an example of how they got it wrong. In uh, the Gospel of Matthew, they had another discussion where Jesus is just slamming them, saying, you guys don't understand. They tried to test Jesus about marriage and divorce, and he just showed them, you don't even understand what the Scriptures say. You are so off track. And this takes me to a lesson that applies to each and every one of us, this is kind of an application, but what it is is, guys, we have to test every spirit, especially today. How many churches are there where the people standing in front 
are teaching things that are completely twisted from what God has given us. The Pharisees were false prophets in a way, teaching things that were not what God was wanting the Jews then to learn. Today, we have the same thing going on. So we have to test every spirit. In 1 John 4, 1, we're told, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test spirits to see whether they are for God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. There are a lot of false prophets out there. That's why Pastor Nasser every week, and I'll say the same, we say, guys, go back and check what we're telling you. Read this. Look at the parables. Go back and look at the references I have. That's why we give you these sheets so that you can go back and check them. Some of our life groups do sermon reflections so that we can dig into this, and we want you to test us. You know, we're human too. We make mistakes occasionally. Not often, but occasionally. <laughs> Not me, uh, no, but we do. So, I mean, we want you to test, and God tells us that. Test every spirit, and that is so important today. I think that is, well, I can't speak for back then, but that is so important today. Amen? Amen. Everybody still with me? Yes. All right, so Jesus has just gone and, and beat up on the Pharisees, and guess what? Now he's going to completely blow their minds. This last parable, I mean, he doesn't tell us what the reaction is, but we can imagine what the reaction is with this parable. All right, verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. All right, here's another rich man. This rich man's got it all. I mean, in today, he's got a private jet. All right, he's dining in... I don't know if any of you have Sullivan Steakhouse every night. That's a steakhouse. I've never been there, but I looked online. The cheapest steak they had, 55 bucks. And that didn't even include the fixins or the stuff they put on top. All right? Now, I've been told it's delicious. So anybody watching online, I'm not bad-mouthing your restaurant. I've been told it's delicious. All right? But you're going to spend a fortune there. This guy ate there breakfast, noon, and night. If you ate steak every breakfast, noon, and night. That's where he was eating. He had it all. To the Pharisees, this rich man was blessed by God. You know, he was at the very top of God's checklist of people that he loved. That's where the Pharisees thought he was. And then there's this poor man, Lazarus, verse 20 and 21. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. All right, so here's the poor man, you know, very poor. According to the Pharisees, he's down here at the bottom. Remember when Jesus healed the lame man and the Sadducees and Pharisees, they called him in and they said, well, who sinned, you or your parents? All right, that's what they believed, is that if you were really poor or had issues, you were a sinner or your parents were, and God has got you down here. So to the Pharisees, here's the rich man in God's eyes, here's the poor man in God's eyes. Remember, they were lovers of money. So then what happens? The parable continues. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and at Lazarus' side, Lazarus at his side. The Pharisees' brains just went, Pow! no, 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 the rich man's supposed to be here. The rich man was here. The poor man's supposed to be here. The poor man was here. All right, this isn't a, Jesus isn't making a, truth here about riches saying that you can't be rich and go to heaven. It's not what he's saying. There's going to be many rich people in heaven. There's going to be many poor people in hell, unfortunately. But what he's saying is it's not about wealth. We're supposed to use our wealth wisely, but salvation is not based upon wealth. But the Pharisees to them, oh yeah, it is. So they just, their minds exploded and from other examples, you know they're just angry and upset. 
with Jesus for telling that truth, and that's because they had it so wrong. They were so wrong on what they believed. Was he done? No, he continued. Jesus always got him. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flames. All right, guess what? He's back to, well, verse 25, but Abraham said, child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. Back to the lesson on get your priorities straight. Get our priorities straight. If God has blessed us with unrighteous wealth, he's not calling us to eat at Sullivan's every day and to have a private jet. That's not what he's calling us to. He's calling us to use our resources wisely to help people make friends who are going to welcome us into heaven or that we're going to welcome into heaven. That's what he's calling us to do. And he continues. So they said, and he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him, whoops, we're doing 26, And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and more may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send them to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And the rich man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone rise from the dead. And that takes you back to our lesson of share the gospel, make disciples, repeat. For the rich man, it was too late. It was too late for him to share the gospel with his brothers. He's asking Go do something. Help my brothers. Well, that's what God is calling us to. That's what God is saying. We need to be wise with our resources to where we can share the gospel and make the disciples and repeat. Now, are some of the people we share the gospel with going to ignore? Of course. He said, for some people, even if you raised a dead man to life, they're not going to believe, and we know that. There are some people that no matter how much we share the truth, they're not going to accept but we still share it. We still share the truth with them. And to the ones who do accept, they become our friends. And then they can make disciples. And then we all can repeat. Because we know that God's desire is that none should perish. His desire is that when we get to heaven, we have a gigantic welcoming committee that is there waiting for us. And isn't that our desire? Shouldn't that be our desire too? Yeah. So we want to use our wealth wisely that he's provided to us. We want to be shrewd, not dishonest like the manager, but shrewd to where we are using it in a way that is helping people to come to know the truth of who Jesus Christ is and have that life-giving relationship. So I'm going to end with that self-examination question. Are you a good manager of your resources that God has provided you? He's provided you everything. He can take it away. And are are you using them according to his desires? That's something we all need to reflect on and pray about. Now, in a second, I'm going to pray for us. But first, I'm going to, while I'm um, praying, I'm going to ask the prayer warriors who are scheduled to be up here at this hour to come forward. And church, we're a family. If you have any needs, please come forward. If there's anything that you need prayer for, that's why we're here. We want to pray for and with you. 
So please take advantage of these men and women that are going to come forward and pray with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what an honor and privilege it is to be your sons and daughters. Lord, I just ask that today you use the truths that are in chapter 16 of Luke to grow us in a way to where we become better managers of the gifts that you've blessed us with. I know this was focused on money, but Lord, it's not just money. It's time. It's energy. It's the, the spiritual gifts that you've bestowed upon us. Help us to be good managers of every resource you've provided us to help those who don't know you to come to know you because we know that is your heart. Lord, thank you for the opportunities you give us. When those doors open, give us the boldness to walk right through them, to share the gospel with people who need to hear it. And Lord, if they reject, which many will, it doesn't mean that we haven't done what you told us to. We are stepping out in faith and sharing with all who give us that opportunity. And Lord, I just ask that each person here, you give them that boldness, you give them that strength, you transform us to where we have the right words to help those who don't know you. Because we want to be that light, we want to be that shining city on the hill that beckons all to you. Lord, you are our king, and we give you all praise, honor, and glory. It's in your most holy and precious name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen.